Right before we jump into this video, if you'd like me to send you a free guide to capturing motion in low light situations, just look for this orange box over on fronosphoto.com, put your name, email address in it, hit send it. I'm gonna send you that guide for free. Jared Poland, Fronos Photo. Dot com, and this is a pretty big comparison between the Nikon Z8, the Sony a7R5, and the Canon R5. Now, I've taken all of these cameras out into the real world to test them out so that we can put them together with all of the specs, at least on paper, to help you decide which camera might be the right one for you. Now, this is interesting because the Z8 is the newest and the Canon R5 is the oldest. And at the time of recording this, there's rumblings of a second generation of the R5 coming. But at this point, they are not here. And this camera is starting to get a little long in the tooth. But how are the specs? Well, we're going to find out when we go through all of these cameras, but if you want to check out my hands-on previews or reviews or one year later reviews, they are linked down below in the description. Also, if you find these videos helpful, please give it a thumbs up. So this should be pretty interesting to see which camera might be the right one for you. Let's start off with the image sensor. The Z8 has a 45.7 megapixel full frame stacked BSI CMOS sensor that's powered by an Xpeed 7 processor. That is the same exact setup as their much more expensive or $1,500 more expensive flagship Nikon Z9. We'll get back to stacked versus non-stacked in just a second. The Sony a7R5 has a 61 megapixel full frame BSI CMOS sensor powered by a Bionz XR processor. It also can do a 26 megapixel oversampled raw photo and the Canon R5 gives you a 45 megapixel full frame CMOS sensor powered by a Digic X processor which is the same that you find in the Canon R3 which is not their flagship flagship camera. We've talked about that in the past. So we've got stack sensors or stack sensor in here and non stack sensor in these two. What does that mean? Well, a stack sensor is giving you a faster readout. For example, take a look at these two photos on the screen. You have a baseball player swinging to hit the ball, and with a stack sensor, the bat looks straight and the ball isn't bowing. With the non-stack sensor, a regular sensor, you can see that you are getting some bowing of the bat and some bowing of the ball. That's because of how fast the readout speed is of a stack sensor versus the slower readout speed of a non-stack sensor when you are using the electronic shutter mode. Now, with that being said, you have no shutter, no full shutter in this Nikon Z8. You do have full mechanical shutters in both of these cameras. So when you are shooting with the mechanical shutter, it's going to give you the same non-warping that you would get right here with the stacked sensor. So that's a bunch to talk about right there, but this is where the future is going, and Nikon has pushed the future ahead with the stacked sensor game. Now, in terms of which is the best sensor up here, I probably would lean towards the Sony just the 61 megapixel BSI sensor. The fact that if you want to get a smaller RAW file and you want to do it with a crop, you can do that right inside of the camera. That is nice. But if you're looking to do landscapes, you want the best color that you're going to pull out of something, I think you're going to get it right here. Now with 61 megapixels, there's always caveats because we'll get into shooting speed. With the 45 megapixel of the R5, this is a fantastic camera. When it came out, it was fantastic. With 45 megapixels, you're shooting at 12 12 frames a second with the mechanical and 20 frames per second with the electronic shutter. With the Sony, you're getting 10 frames per second with the mechanical in high plus mode with 12-bit compressed RAW, 6 frames per second in uncompressed or lossless compressed RAW, 4 frames of Jesus, 4 frames a second, Steven, seriously? Jesus, four frames a second with the electronic shutter. I just want to leave the frame. We need to leave the frame because Four frames a second with the electronic shutter. It, 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 the Z8 does that in its sleep. That isn't, that is terrible. Come on, so why am I talking like this? It's like I'm hitting puberty right in front of your eyes. That is horrible. What this camera does have, it does offer you the variable shutter for if you are shooting in flickering light. The Canon, which I didn't mention, actually doesn't have it. Future models will probably be adding that because even lower end Canon cameras that have come out after this are already adding that into it. So when we see something like an R5 Mark II, we'll probably be seeing that. Now, back to the uh, electronic shutter that's so bad in this camera, you're probably 
probably not going to want to use it. The reason you're not going to want to use it is one, it's four frames a second. That's pretty bad. But the jelloing effect that you get is going to be far worse in this camera than it is in the R5. It is, it, it's just such a slow readout speed when you are shooting. So you're most likely not going to be using this camera with the electronic shutter. Now, in terms of frames per second with the Z8 for stills, you can get 20 frames per second. Now you can shoot at 30 frames and 60 frames and 120 frames per second, but that is only if you shoot in JPEG. So if you are a raw shooter, you can only shoot at 20 frames per second with the well the electronic shutter and to get raw because you do not have any other shutter options inside of this camera so that's quite a lot of information to take in there i want to get back to the center because we like to give check marks here look if you're going to do landscapes you're going to put a check mark in front of the sony because well, that's a pretty fantastic sensor all the way around when it comes to the these are both 45 megapixels so Let's give them both check marks for being 45 megapixels. So everybody's getting a check mark right off of here. But you have to think about these three cameras. They offer you different things. And at the end of this, we're going to break it all down to help you decide which one might be the right one for you if you're looking for a new system. If you're looking for these three cameras and you're trying to decide which one might be the right one for you. Let me jump in here real quick because I want to show you FROPAC 3 in action on files from all three of these cameras, starting with the Canon EOS R5. We've got Zoolander, followed by Winnebago, Prestige Worldwide, November Rain, Mount Airy, Mentos, MDMA, King Contrast, Eckert, Capone, Canadian Tuxedo, Almost Famous, as well as Fifth Element. Now check this one out from the Sony A7R5. With one click, we hit it with Skittles from Fropac 1, and boom, it looks great. And lastly, from the same sensor as the Zine 8. Skittles on this, boom, one click, it looks awesome. If you're looking to speed up your raw workflow or give yourself a great starting point, or you're just tired of presets not working that you're purchasing, ours absolutely work. We created 15 custom Lightroom presets that you can check out right now at Fronos Photo dot com slash fropack3. While you're over there, you can play with the sliders to see the befores and the afters. And if you decide to pick them up right now, they're currently on sale. Or if you want to save even more and get Skittles, which is a part of Fropack 1, you can get the triple play bundle that is Fropack 1, 2, and 3 and save even more. Now, let's get back to the comparison. All right, let's move on to the mount. You've got a Z mount, you have an E mount, and you have an RF mount. At this point, there are two cameras up here that allow you to put third-party lenses onto these cameras, and that started with the E-mount, which was the first one to do it with the mirrorless cameras, and the next one to do it after that was Nikon. You can get some Sigma lenses coming out soon on the Nikon version. You can also get Tamron lenses, which are currently out, but they're not their higher-end lenses. Whereas you can get great Sigma art lenses and the nice Tamron 2.8s, you can put them on to the E-mount. And with Canon, with the RF, they haven't fully unlocked that mount for third-party support at this point. I can almost guarantee that it will be coming at some point, and it's probably not too far off. But right now, we should just throw it off the whole counter because it failed at doing that right now. But if we're going to give a check mark to a mount, uh, uh, well, they're all pretty good mounts. Um, but in terms of third-party lens support, the E-mount is still the best because there's a ton of glass that you can add to that. I love the Canon glass. Canon has some fantastic RF options that you can't find anywhere else. You have your 28 to 70 F2, you have your 51.2, your 85.12, your 135.18, your 100 macro, your 100 to 300 2.8 zoom lens. You have the big ass glass. Nikon, on the other hand, has a very solid native Z mount lineup of lenses. They've got their 400 2.8 with a TC in it. They have a 600 F4 with a TC in it. That's revolutionary. They have the basic 14 to 24 2.8, the 24 to 70 2.8, the 70 to 200 28. You have the 85 and the 51.2, and of course, they're going to come out with more lenses. You have solid options across the board. I'm partial to the, the Canon RF lineup. In fact, we are shooting with Canon R5s right now, and the 28 to 70 F2, which is my all-time favorite lens, I carry that thing wherever I go because it's absolutely fantastic. That's what we're shooting this video with right now here in the studio. So I love the options that I have there. But Sony has great options. Tamron, Sigma, great options for here. Uh, so, you know, across the board, you can't go wrong with 
either of these mounts. And I shouldn't forget that with the Nikon and the Canon, you can adapt older F mount Nikon lenses. And with the Canon, you can adapt EF glass and you're not gonna lose any focusing ability. I do that all the time with the Canons. Now, in terms of ISO, the Zine 8 gives you 64 to 25,600 natively, expandable up to 102,400. The A7R5 is 100 to 32,000 natively, expandable to 102,400, and the R5 is is 100 to 51,200 expandable up to that 102,000 400. Now I will say we've shot this R5 when it first came out at 16,000 ISO in a dark environment and it held up extremely well. What I absolutely love here though, and I'm giving a check mark for ISO for the low side to Nikon. The fact that they can do native 64 is fantastic. I love that the camera can do that and that Nikon has been doing that all along. And then the low you can get here is just 100. There is a difference when you can do 64 ISO. That is basically a whole stop. Now I push the A7R5 in a studio situation. Now, not a photo studio situation, but a music studio situation to around 8,000. It wasn't the worst when you got the raw file back into the computer. Sure, there's some extra grain there because you have your 61 megapixels and that might happen when you bump the ISO. And the Nikon, we've pushed pretty far too and is fine. These cameras across the board are going to be fantastic when it comes to higher ISO, even though they're 45 megapixels and 61 megapixels respectively. They all get a passing grade. Something I find important important is the max shutter speed that you can get out of the cameras. The Z8 is giving you a max shutter speed of 1 32,000th of a second, and that's with an electronic shutter. That is fantastic because if you're shooting at 64 ISO outside and you're at 1 32,000th of a second and you can still be at 1 2, that is great. Whereas both of these cameras top out at 1 8,000th of a second. That's not that good in my opinion in this day and age. That was the, the mainstay back in the day, but one eight thousandth of a second, sometimes you want more, especially like I just said with those faster 1.2 pieces of glass. So Nikon, you are getting a check mark. Moving on to card slots. Each of these cameras have two card slots. Actually, technically Sony could maybe have four, which I'll explain in just a second. The Nikon has one CF Express Type B card slot and one UHS-2 SD card slot. And that's the same with the Canon. You have one SD card slot and one CF Express Type B slot. Personally, I like having the same card redundant wise. I like to have either two SD or two of the faster cards. But honestly, after shooting with the R5 for a long time and shooting the R3 with a CF Express B and an SD card, it's really not that big of a deal at this point. It's great. You put those two cards in there. They're not taking away from your ability to shoot super fast and to transfer from the buffer to the card. That's not a problem at all. But with the Sony, remember when I said it kind of has four card slots? Well, that's because it has dual CF Express Type A slots. They're smaller cards, but they are reverse compatible with SD card slots or SD cards. So you could either put a CF Express A in there or an SD card. That is fantastic. One of the downsides to the CF Express A at this point is they're slightly more expensive than CF Express Type B. They're also not as fast, but I like the option for the reverse compatibility for a lot of people out there that don't need the speed, not that this thing shoots super fast, anyway, you would be perfectly fine with two SD cards in this camera. So I'm going to go ahead and give a check mark. You know, let, you know what? let's give it a half a check mark because it sort of gets it right with the same card slots and that bonus of the SDs. So half a check mark to the Sony. And by the way, if you guys didn't know, check marks actually don't mean anything. They're just check, but we don't add them up. You could try to keep score and let us know down below though, which one you think gets the win. Now let's move on to autofocus. This is an interesting one because the Z8 has the same autofocus that you found in the flagship Nikon Z9. It is a very good autofocus, at least for Nikon. In terms of the best Nikon, the best focusing Nikon, ever. It's got your lock on tracking, your animal AF, your IAF. You could turn off the tracking and go back to the old school way of doing it. It's not my favorite autofocusing system. It's one of those that struggles a little more, at least compared to these two. And so that's just something to take into consideration. 
but it still does a fantastic job. It just is a lot more quirky, and sometimes you may find yourself missing images that you shouldn't miss or that you wouldn't miss with these other two systems. Now, the Sony a7R5 has the same autofocus that we've come to love in a lot of the Sony cameras, but they added this AI processor, which has taken the autofocus capability of this camera and exploded it beyond some of the, even the flagship A1. I find that this new processor has brought the autofocus capability even closer to Canon, who I find is in the lead when it comes to autofocus. A couple years ago, Sony had the lead by far, especially over a Nikon, but Canon caught up very quickly and there was a time where I was like, I think they're about even, but now I feel that the Canon autofocus is slightly better. Now between the R5 and the A7R5, with that new AI processor in here, these are are pretty darn close. Now, the R5 here has a fantastic dual pixel AF system. We use it to track me whenever I'm walking. I use it predominantly when I'm shooting action. Actually, I leave it on all the time because the autofocus is that good. If I was to select a winner here for which has the best autofocus, it's gonna be very tough. The Sony and the Canon are very close at this point with that new AI processor. The Nikon is very good. But I still feel that even the R5 has better autofocusing and lock-on tracking capability than the Nikon. But it's not like it's night and day like it used to be. Nikon has gotten better and it will continue to get better in future iterations of the camera. And with that being said, I don't think you're gonna see much better autofocus come via firmware. There's only so much firmware can do for all of these cameras. So remember that hardware is something that can't be changed in a camera until you go and you get a new camera in the future. The firmware, they can change it, but it may not give you that much more capabilities than you already have in the camera because there's limitations when it comes to hardware. The moral of the story, these are some of the best autofocusing cameras in the history of photography. So check mark to me because I want a check mark. Let me cut in here real quick and let you know that this video is brought to you by Squarespace. If you're looking to build your very own online portfolio, use what I've used for my personal photo website for more than 10 years. 10 years! Because it's simple, easy, affordable, and you don't need to know coding, and I guarantee you, you'll have a fully functioning photo website up in a matter of 20 to 30 minutes. So to get your 14-day free trial, head on over to squarespace.com slash photo. If you decide that it's for you, use the code photo at checkout to get 10% off your first order. Now, back to the comparison. Now let's move on to video. Starting with the Z8, full frame UHD 8K video recording up to 30 frames per second with no pixel binning. You can do full frame 4K up to 60 frames per second, which is oversampled from 8K, which is great. 4K up to 120 frames per second. You've got ProRes 422 HQ and ProRes RAW internal recording. Most video modes are available in 10-bit 422 color. You've got 8K 12-bit RAW video up to 60p, which you can record internally. Now those are some pretty stacked specs, at least on paper, but let's move on to the Sony. You've got cropped UHD 8K video recording up to 24 frames per second with a 1.2X crop with no pixel binning. You can do full frame 4K up to 60 frames per second with a 1.2X crop with some binning. You can do Super 35 cropped 4K up to 30 frames per second oversampled from 6.2K with no pixel binning, 1080p up to 120 frames per second. Most video modes are available in 10-bit 422 color except 8K, which is 420. You can do 4K 16-bit raw video output. Now, Sony did not push this camera as the best video camera capabilities in the history of video camera capabilities. This is predominantly a stills camera focused type thing, but you do have the ability to shoot video and you do get some very nice video out of it. It's just not their flagship or their main go-to if you're looking for a hybrid shooting stills plus video. But then again, if you know what you're doing, you can get some fantastic results out of here, but this is all about comparing it to the other two up on the desk. So the R5 does full frame DCI 8K video recording up to 30 frames per second with no pixel binning. You 
You have full frame 4K up to 120 frames per second with binning, 4K HQ mode up to 30 frames per second over sampled from 8.1K with no pixel binning, all video modes available in 10-bit 422 color, 8K 12-bit raw video up to 30p in Internally. Now, again, this is the oldest camera here. We've been using it for a couple of years to film all of the videos, or the, predominantly all of the videos that we filmed here at the studio for everything, uh, and it's been fantastic. I do suspect that when the R5 Mark II comes out, it might push the video quality to the next level, but we are very happy with the quality of video that we get out of the Canon, especially when you put on the RF glass. Nice and sharp, nice and colorful. The Nikon, you get nice video with it. The specs are loaded, like I said, but sometimes we feel that it's not as sharp as we would want it to be, just out of the camera. Like I said, all three of these cameras are fantastic. And the Z8 honestly blows these other two out of the water, at least on paper. But in our real world usage, we are very happy with what we get out of the R5. We like the results that we get out of it. So for us, we're sticking with the R5 for what we do, but if you're someone new and you love the, the, the still specs and the, the specs that you get for video, this might be the answer for you. And that's something that Nikon is pushing pretty hard. They're pushing video very hard in this camera and that's why it's stacked at least on paper. Now there's some extra video features we need to talk about with these cameras. The Z8 has no digital hot shoe. You could do unlimited record time. It has a full HDMI port, dual USB-C ports, which is pretty cool. One for data transfer, one for charging the battery. You have N-Log, waveforms, vector scopes, high-res zoom, red record tally light, and a bunch more stuff. But the biggest thing here that is so upsetting is that it didn't add a digital hot shoe. Now, the Sony has a digital hot shoe. The two and a half plus year old Canon doesn't. And that kind of makes sense for being two and a half years old. But we know that Canon has already put out digital hot shoes in their lower end $1,500 R8. The R6 Mark II has a digital hot shoe. So I suspect the next version, I mean, this makes sense, will have a digital hot shoe. And the fact that Nikon didn't do it doesn't make any sense at all because digital hot shoes are a fantastic option. You plug a microphone right into the hot shoe. You don't need to have cables. Now you have to make sure that it is a digital hot shoe compatible microphone, but now it just passes the audio directly from the microphone through the hot shoe into your camera with no cables. So. That's kind of a miss on Nikon's front. Now, we have a digital hot shoe, like I said, right here. You have a heat dissipation body for unlimited record time, full HDMI port, focus breathing correction, S-Log and s cinetone color. You have your red record tally light. And of course, there are more smaller features that we don't need to go into. Now on the Canon front, you have no digital hot shoe, which we already talked about. You have a record time of 2959, which is a record limit that makes no sense, still makes no sense. I don't know why a firmware update can't get rid of that because their next generation cameras that are below this already have better record times. In fact, we've had to stop recording this video once because we hit the record limit and we had to start back over, but through the art of editing, you didn't even know that. So if I didn't tell you, you would, you would have never, never have known. You would have thought it was unlimited, but it's something that we have to keep an eye on where in the future, we, we don't have to do that because there won't be a record limit in the future. You have a micro HDMI port. It has focus breathing correction as well as C-Log. So as you can see, they're all loaded with still features and video features, but now let's move on to stabilization. The Z8 offers you five axis in-body stabilization, up to six stops of stabilization with certain lenses. There is no sensor shift available, meaning you can't take a higher res image where it takes like eight images and stitches them together for super high resolution uh, landscape type images. The Sony has five axis in-body stabilization up to eight stops of compensation with the IBIS mechanism alone. So what Sony is saying is that they don't even need to be paired with lenses that have image stabilization in it to still get the eight stops of stabilization. This is the future for the Sony cameras. You can expect that the mechanism in here is going to find its way into other cameras. And the Canon has five axis in-body stabilization up to eight stops of compensation with certain lenses and seven stops with most lenses. Now, keep in mind, Sony is saying 
that you can get eight stops regardless of the lens, whether it has the IS or doesn't have the IS. So you know what, if Sony says it, we might as well give them a check mark. In reality, is it that big of a difference? The answer is no. They all have very good in-body stabilization. Jumping on to the viewfinder, the Z8 has a 3.69 million dot EVF with 120 frames per second refresh rate. The Sony has a 9.44 million dot EVF with 120 frames per second refresh rate. The Canon has a 5.76 million dot EVF with a 120 frame per second refresh rate. They are all very good. Even with people being upset that the Nikon is only 3.69 million dots, I don't see a difference when I look through all of these uh, that it's perceivable that one is better than the other. The Nikon is big and vibrant and it looks very good. The Sony, I mean, it has 9 million. Just because you have more doesn't mean it's going to be the best. It's still a nice viewfinder, but I will say that I think when it comes, I've shot with all of these, right? And I've shot across the board with all of the Nikons, Canons, and Sonys. I still feel that, that Canon does a better job of transitioning in lighting situations to keep the viewfinder closer to the proper and natural representation of the exposure in the scene that I'm shooting. And what that means is the, the Sony, if you go into a bright area, it's going to brighten up the viewfinder really fast. And then if it gets dark, it just, drops it all the way down. So it's not incremental. The Nikon's pretty incremental, but the Canon is the best when it comes to that, at least for me to get my exposure spot on. Hi, how are you? Do you like podcasts? Well, if you said yes, we have a podcast called Fronos Photo Raw Talk, where we talk about all things photography, going over new gear that comes out, all the photo news, but sometimes we end up off topic and just talk about topical events. And it's free, cause you know, it's a podcast. So to get our podcast, head on over to fronosphoto.com slash podcast or download wherever you get your podcasts. Now the LCD screens, we've got a 3.2 inch, 2.1 million dot, four axis tilting touch screen on the back of the Nikon. The Sony has a 3.2 inch, 2.36 million dot, four axis multi-angle touch screen. It can tilt and rotate, so you're getting the best of both worlds. That's what my notes told me, so I read it to you just like that. It really does have the best of both worlds. That, that is a fantastic mechanism in this. And then the Canon has a 3.2 inch, 2.1 million dot vary angle touch screen. I'm still not a fan of the full flip out. Let me show you this with the R5, something I really don't like. I want the screen to be able to pull out and tilt down. I can't do that. I have to do this off to the side. The problem is, we can see this, right, Steven? Yeah. I'm holding the camera flat. You can see this is like a bouncy board, a springboard. It's not flat to the back. So you're never gonna get your line straight. I wanna be able to hold it up like this and have it tilt back. The fact that I can't do that is terrible in the Canons and I've said it all along. That's why I'm a big proponent of looking through the electronic viewfinder wherever possible. But for example, when I use the R8 Canon, which has the same exact flip out and rotatable style screen, and I was at the Louvre, I had to leave it on the back of the camera and hold it above my head and try to get my lines straight, which I ended up getting them perfectly straight because for some reason I'm able to get lines straight. But the fact that it can't tilt back to make it easier is a problem. So that's terrible. And, and Nikon is fine. It's a little outdated at this point because they still had it in the Z9 and they didn't refine it anymore. But look, look the, the Sony has a really nice option for their flip out screen. Moving on to the body. The Z8 is a massive body compared to these, but it does feel nice in the hands. They have a nice body. It's nice and rugged. It feels good. The Sony is still the smaller and daintier version, but it feels much better than Sony's of the past in the hand. But Sony is all about making things smaller. That's just what they do. Remember the original PlayStation or PlayStation 2, and then you got the PlayStation 2 Mini? Yeah, it made quite a difference when they shrunk it. Sony's all about how small can they make it, but they've done a better job of making it more ergonomic, ergo ergonomic ergon is it ergonomic that's the word to make it ergonomic to fit into your hands and then the, the Canon's fine the R5 still feels great in the hands they've done a nice job there so that is feel but what about weight the Nikon weighs in at two pounds or 910 grams the Sony weighs in at 1.6 pounds or 723 grams and the Canon weighs in at 1.62 pounds or 738 grams so very similar between the Canon and the Sony and then the Nikon is just a chunky boy because it's up there. Nikon doesn't care about miniaturizing anything at all. They're like, all right, guys, you want to make a small camera? 
will just make it chunky in your hands. Now you would think a bigger, chunkier camera body would mean a bigger battery. Well, no, you've got the ENEL15C battery. You do have the ability to USB-C charge while you're using the camera, and you can get a vertical grip for this to add an extra battery as well. The Sony, you can use the NPFZ100 battery. It does USB-C charging while using it. And of course you can get a grip too, because these are higher end cameras from these companies. And then the Canon, you can get an LPE6 NH battery with USB charging while you're using it and a grip is available. Now these batteries are all smaller in comparison to the flagship larger batteries. I always recommend have at least two extra batteries when you're out in the world shooting. And of course you could get a USB-C charging bank in this day and age, because that could give you extra juice when you need it. So they all are gonna be very similar across the board when it comes to battery life. Now is a good time to say buy genuine batteries from all of these cameras. Do not buy third party Watson batteries or whoever else makes batteries. Camera stores will try and tell you that, well, they come off the same manufacturing line. I don't believe that at all. And I've found that third party batteries have a tendency to just die on you at the time that you don't need it to die on you. So I recommend spend the extra money, buy the genuine Nikon, genuine Sony, genuine Canon batteries. And if you buy them, buy them from a reputable resource or a reputable store. Try not to buy them on Amazon because Amazon has had trouble with people selling counterfeit chargers and counterfeit batteries. And that's the last thing you wanna get is that. Rant over, buy extra batteries. Now here's a body feature that Nikon absolutely wins and that's turning on and turning off. It's instant on, instant off, and you have a thing called sensor shield. Because there's no shutter in this camera, there is something called sensor shield that when you turn the camera off, it pops right down. You turn it on, pops right off, it's instant, or pops right up, it's instant. It also protects that sensor from dust and anything else that might get in there. That's nice. The Sony is still slow to start. It's one of the slower turning on cameras and one of the slower turning off cameras. It offers you the option to bring down the shutter to try and protect it, but it's not a sensor shield. Right? It's just the shutter, which is very dainty. It also takes too long to come down, which means I turn that feature off when I'm changing lenses because it's waiting two seconds or more. I don't want that. Canon has the same problem as well. It's a little faster to turn on than the Sony, but I turn off that sensor coming down, uh, the, the shutter coming down option too, because it just takes too long when I'm trying to change lenses. So Nikon's getting a check mark right meow for that. And finally, let's talk about price. The Nikon Z8 is $39.96.95, A7R5 is $38.99.99, and the R5, which is currently on sale while we're recording this for $33.99 with a free grip, is normally priced at $38.99. So across the board, they are priced very similarly. Nikon's the newest, that's why it's slightly more expensive, but it also on paper is stacked with the features. It's fantastic. But across the board, you can't go wrong with either of these cameras. If you're starting out today, where do you go? I mean, that's a much longer discussion. The Nikon looks really good. It looks like a good starting option. It, it really does at 4,000 because you have the same thing as a $5,500 flagship Nikon Z9. So this is great for stills, great for video. A7R5, fantastic for stills, gonna be very good for video. You're gonna get nice quality with that 61 megapixel sensor. Maybe not as, uh, as good or capable at higher ISOs as these two, but still an extremely viable camera if you're getting into portrait photography. I shot sports with it, but it's pretty damn slow when it comes to shooting sports with that six frames per second uncompressed, and I've never squeezed 10 frames per second out of this camera camera yet to save my life. And the R5 is still an extremely versatile camera two and a half years later. It matches up very well against these cameras. Great for stills with your 12 frames per second, your 20 frames per second with the electronic shutter, fantastic autofocus and video that we use here at the studio. All great options. But which is gonna win the wind tunnel test, Steven? This is new, we've never done wind tunnel test here for, for this type of comparison, so let's blow. <sighs> Shit, Nikon totally loses because it's a brick wall and the other two so pass. The, the Canon wins wind tunnel. It's more ergonomically uh, sound, less boxy. So at the end of the day, which one would you go with and why? Let me know down below. Thank you guys very much for watching. Jared, PolandFronosPhoto.com. See ya.